questions and you're going to show a few slides. Yes, perfect okay. for me. Perfect, fantastic. Okay. Okay. So, Andre, you can tell me when to start. There's still people coming in. I see 32. 32, yes, they're still coming in. I think I, we ha can have uh, something like uh, four or five minutes. Sure, maybe you can speak. Uh, does everybody have a pretty good handle on English? Should I speak slower or is this okay? Колеги, чи всім все зрозуміло з англійською мовою, чи треба, щоб професор Лолонд казав трошки повільніше, чи нормально? Можете писати в чат, спокійно я передам. Так. Is it right that that's normal? This is pretty good. Uh, all clear. Uh, most of uh, our, I think everybody, <laughs> maybe, uh, of our, uh, in our society know uh, English because um, uh, everybody in our society is uh, like a fash member. Okay. Uh, we try to make some talks on FASH, make some presentations on FASH this year too. So I hope we, we can see each other in London. Yeah, exactly. I hope so too. Okay, well, I'll just wait for you to tell me to start and uh, maybe you want to uh, make some hello uh, as president of the society. Thank you so much for inviting us. S secretary. <laughs> No, the president, our president is now uh, in uh, with his family uh, just around the Kiev. Okay. Uh, so uh, I try to make everything organized. Okay, fantastic. Отже, колеги, Професор Лолон ще також запропонував, якщо вам цікаво, він е, зможе нам прочитати ще декілька лекцій е, на різні теми. Якщо вам цікаво буде, якщо ви за, ну, підтримаєте цю пропозицію, е, то напишіть в чат, можете поставити плюсик чи навіть е, плюс-мінус якусь назву лекції, е, яку б ви хотіли послухати. І... Я думаю, що професор Лолонд і Жан-Поль Брутус залюбки нам зможуть допомогти в цьому. I just said that uh, you and uh, Jean-Paul uh, said that uh, they will gladly, that you will gladly uh, make some other webinars. Uh, another th teams about Wolland. So uh, if everybody is okay with this, I think we can manage that and uh, think about uh, when we can make another and another webinar or uh, a theme or another webinar. Okay, perfect. So would you like me to go ahead and start? Uh, okay. Uh, I will make an announcement, uh, yeah. dear colleagues. Uh, today we have a great pleasure of having the two uh, our big friends, uh, Professor Donald Lalonde uh, and Jean Paul Brutus from Canada. Professor Lalonde right now is in Ireland at the Ireland Hand Surgery Society meeting, uh, but uh, he is. Uh, uh, gladly, uh, it's time to uh, make this talk for us. Uh, he offered his help, uh, and as a very experienced surgeon, uh, Professor Lalonde and uh, Jean Paul Brutus, uh, they know that the war is very extreme uh, situation, and. Uh, uh, in many uh, time, we must do something with the patients when we don't have the main operating room, when the main operating room is uh, with other patients. So we need uh, to make uh, something 
uh, thumbs and good to our patients with uh, so-called low resources. Yeah, when we don't have the main operating room. And uh, today we need to understand that uh, uh, almost everything in uh, extremities we can do with volant, uh, like uh, wide awake, uh, local anesthesia without tourniquet, just the headlight. We don't need a, a big light on our ceilings or something like that. We can have just a, a headlight and uh, very interesting and very important thing that uh, about sterility. Uh, the evidence-based data said that the main uh, thing that's the local sterility. We don't need a big uh, sterility about everything else, the sterile area or something like that uh, to make some operation. The main thing is local sterility. So. Uh, I think that's that's very important things. Uh, today we start with the lecture of Professor Lalonde, and uh, then after questions and answers, uh, Jean Paul Brutus will uh, take a scene and uh, share with us some cases uh, and talk. So, okay, I think Professor. Thank you very much again <laughs> that you offer your help and uh, this floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm very, very grateful to be here and I'm grateful for all of you uh, for taking some important time to hear what might be helpful for you. So um, there are three major changes in Canadian surgery that may help you in Ukraine. And the first is that I uh, almost never use the tourniquet anymore uh, for extremity surgery. And I'm going to show you both upper and lower limb where we use lidocaine with epinephrine uh, for um, anesthesia and for hemostasis instead of a tourniquet. And because you don't need a tourniquet, you don't need sedation. And because you don't need sedation, you don't need the main operating room. So I'm gonna start with a very simple case just to explain what tumescent local anesthesia means. Tumescent local anesthesia is enough volume that you can see it easily and feel it two centimeters beyond any place you will insert sharp objects. So this lady has a rheumatoid hand and she cannot extend her fourth and fifth fingers and you see the rheumatoid synovitis. So the first thing I do is I draw two centimeters beyond wherever I'm going to cut. And now I'm going to inflate that whole area with local anesthesia so that so I can see it. So at count three, try not to move. You're gonna feel a little poke. And at the count of two, I want you to take a nice deep breath for me. Okay, so one, take a deep breath and don't move. Great. I push the skin into the needle. And just breathe normally. She barely felt that, she's gonna say that. That's exactly how fast I inject. How sore was that? Well, that's good. She said she barely felt it. So I start with a small needle, I move to a bigger needle. And when I reinsert the needle, I always reinsert it in an area that is clearly tumest. Tumest means that you can see it swollen with the local anesthesia. It's like a big worm under the skin. This is like a beer block, but only where you need it, outside the veins. And you always inject on the ulnar side and then the radial side and then the ulnar side. And then you wait a half an hour for the epinephrine and the local anesthesia to work. And then you go into the operating room and you can, wait even an hour, an hour and a half before surgery, and you have th more than three hours from the time you cut, and it's going to be just fine. So this is the patient at the end of the surgery and two weeks later. 
Get straightened out. You see how your fingers are working pretty well there. That's awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's awful when they're not working. So the incision is buried, monocryl. There's no nylon, no stitch marks, none of that foolishness. And go ahead and show us a fist again and straighten out. So for three and a half weeks, uh, that's excellent movement. So if you do tendon transfers awake, you can move patients earlier. So what you have to think of is you have to think of big volume. If you put 50 milliliters underneath the skin there, where is it going to go? Everywhere, just like a beer block outside the veins. And if you put 50 milliliters on both sides of the wrist, you can look after a gunshot wound like this one that I looked after in Kumasi, Ghana in 2017. So this man had a four day old gunshot wound with a big wound in his hand and it was full of pus of course and dead muscle. And what we did was I injected just like this, 50 milliliters on the palm side and 50 milliliters on the dorsal side. So now I can do anything I want to the hand and he won't feel a thing. I wait at least a half an hour before I do the surgery. And then what I did, this is him. I took him to the uh, tap to wash out all of the dead muscle and the pus. Uh, and then we rinsed it out with uh, Bridine. Here you see my little finger in the wound, scooping out all of the dead stuff. And uh, we went to a minor procedure room and inserted K-wires. And he never went to the main operating room. Uh, he just went to a minor procedure room, and from there, he went into a ward in the hospital. So this is ideal if you don't have access to the operating room. And here is the basic recipe for lidocaine uh, with adrenaline. Andre, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you guys uh, have... Uh, like the rest of Europe, 1% with 1 in 200,000 epinephrine? Uh, yes, we call it ad adrenaline. Yeah, adrenaline. Perfect. Adrenaline. So you have this, but it's uh, 1 in 200,000. So if, if you have uh, lidocaine with um, adrenaline, if you use 50 milliliters for your average adult, that is plenty safe, just never more than that. And if you need more than 50 milliliters, in the last case, I showed you 100 milliliters, just add saline. So um, I don't use bupivacaine, you don't need it. And I can add 150 milliliters of saline to 50 milliliters of lidocaine with adrenaline. And now I have 200 milliliters and I can do forearm tendon transfers. You can plate a tibia, you can plate forearm fractures, you can do elbow fractures. I'm going to show you that. And you do all that with one quarter percent lidocaine with one in 400,000 epinephrine. So that's 150 milliliters of saline to 50 milliliters of lidocaine with adrenaline. And that's effective up to three hours if you blow it up with tumescent local anesthesia, like I showed you. And close your fingers and open up again. Open up, open up, open up. Okay. So this patient was very sick and uh, Paul Sibley of the United States took this 80 year old and restored hand extend function. Extend your fingers and make a fist. And extend your fingers, make a fist. Excellent, thank you. So even in patients who are very sick, uh, this is very safe because it's just lidocaine. So this is a very important slide. I don't use overhead light anymore. Even when I'm in the main operating room, I don't use it. 
But this is what I use in my office because I operate in my office. I do carpal tunnels and trigger fingers and tendon surgery in my office. And in the hospital, I almost never go to the main operating room anymore. I go to minor procedure rooms with field sterility and I use a headlight. A headlight is a liberator. It will let you operate anywhere in the hospital. So this patient is a very sick man. Uh, I had to do a compartment syndrome release because he had a axillary artery thrombosis uh, after two cardiac arrests. When I'm doing, while I'm doing this, his blood pressure is 60 over 40 and he's on vasopressors and he's in the coronary care unit. I did his surgery in the coronary care unit because a man who is this sick is much better managed under the supervision of a cardiologist and coronary care nurses than he would be in the main operating room uh, with an anesthesiologist and operating room nurses. So you take your surgery where the patient is going to do best. Take your surgery where the patient is going to do best. You don't need to do these things in the main operating room anymore. This is an anesthesiologist from England who uses Wallant all the time in patients who are very sick. Rather than just having plan A and plan B, I'm able to have plan C and plan W, w plan Wallant extremely at high risk where they can't have a general anesthetic, they can't have a uh, regional anesthetic, and they need something which I know is going to work and it's going to be safe for them. So I think it really has helped me in, in those sort of circumstances where I think, well, I can't do plan A, I can't do plan B, and then have to do one. So it's, it's made a big difference to my confidence in where I can apply the Wallen technique, the use of the local anesthetic, the confidence of knowing that actually this technique really does work. So this man was very sick. He was dying of metastatic lung cancer. And I operated on him uh, more for his carpal tunnel than anything because he couldn't sleep at night. That's why he came to me. This is his daughter on the left. She watched the surgery. He was on oxygen and slept sitting at night with his oxygen. So that's how I operated on him. Here I am operating on him in my office, sitting up on his oxygen. And he had no problem at all. And six months after he died, his daughter, who's standing there, wrote me a nice handwritten letter. And she said, Dr. Lalonde, I want to thank you on behalf of my father, because for the last six months of his life, he was able to sleep. His carpal tunnel didn't wake him up. And he's so grateful for that, and so am I. But to put this patient to sleep or give him sedation would not be necessary or a good thing to do. Now, this man had a very smelly, uh, bleeding, uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the scalp. And he died two years later. And he was a, a, a man who could barely breathe. And we excised his cancer. I harvested a big split thickness skin graft from his thigh. Here he is at the end of surgery. We did this in the main operating room, but we did it with Wallant, no tourniquet, no um, sedation. And uh, I just want you to listen to him breathe uh, after his graft is healed. So to take that thing off your head, we took a big piece of skin from your thigh, right? Yeah. And we did that all with freezing. So can you tell me how sore the freezing was? It wasn't sore at all. So this man has shortness of breath on living. And to put him asleep would have been crazy. And this was a good palliative operation that we did with him totally awake. 
So most serious complications of hand surgery are actually serious complications of sedation. Surgery doesn't give you pulmonary embolism or nausea and vomiting or urinary retention or malignant hyperthermia or aspiration pneumonia. These things are all caused by sedation, not by surgery. And all anesthesiologists agree that less sedation is safer than more sedation. So the safest sedation is no sedation. And if you stick with very safe doses, no more than 50 milliliters of 1% lidocaine in an adult, it's extremely safe and they do not need to be monitored. You don't need an EKG monitor. So I'm going to show you some other examples from orthopedic surgeons around the world because I'm a plastic surgeon and I don't do these cases. But this is Carlos de Pina from Portugal uh, doing a proximal row carpectomy and then testing active movement uh, in a patient uh, after he's done the proximal row carpectomy and seeing if he has anything more to do. That's active movement. That's the patient moving himself uh, after the proximal row carpectomy. And this is uh, Thomas uh, Abitbal and, sorry, Thomas Grégory and Dr. Abitbal from France doing a transcaphoid perilunate dislocation with Wallant. And so he did a closed reduction of the uh, dislocated lunate and then tests the active movement and the stability of uh, the lunate with active movement. And then he puts a K wire through the scaphoid and then he puts a uh, screw through the scaphoid and put, has the patient actively moving it. So he's testing his fixation of the scaphoid. And then he adds his K wires uh, and then once again tests the active movement so that he knows he can start early protected movement uh, after the surgery. And here's the patient at five days post op uh, showing uh, some of the active movement that he knows he can do because he saw it done at surgery and he knows that the stability is good. Uh, with active movement. The same patient had a Bennett fracture on the thumb and they did that at the same time with Wallant. And there's the patient after they've put the screw in the base of the thumb. And there's the patient of the other hand. So both hands got Wallant uh, the day of surgery. This is how to inject for a distal radius. So the first thing you do is you blow up the subcutaneous tissue. And this is, this is Amir Ahmad uh, from Malaysia, who it published the first uh, wide awake distal radius fracture. And so first you blow up where you're gonna make the cut. Then, and, and if you look on the left, blue is sub Q. So the blue is where we put the subcutaneous fluid. By the way, this is all in a book that you can buy online. Everything you will see today is in a book that you can see the online version of uh, on the internet. Um, and I've sent you a link for the book so that you can see all these videos. The book has over 500 videos and uh, just about everything that I and Dr. Brutus know. So. Blue is subcutaneous, and then red is where you walk the bone on the periosteum. So if you're doing a long bone fracture, you need to walk the needle on the bone, first uh, on the lateral side, then volarly, then dorsally, so that the entire periosteum is bathed. And you always do your periosteal bathing from proximal to distal. So here he's doing the proximal periosteal walk on the bone, then the middle periosteal walk on the bone, then the distal periosteal walk on the bone. And to do a radius, 
it's 100 milliliters and you only need half saline. So you can use 0.5%. Uh, and in your case, it would be one in 400,000 epinephrine, which is plenty. Uh, you can do the surgery with one in 200,000 epinephrine in Europe, just like we can do the surgery with one in 100,000 epinephrine in North America. These are surgeons, three from the United States, uh, and one from Colombia, one from Taiwan, and one from England, all doing distal radius uh, fractures. Chen Yu Chen from Taiwan has published a prospective series of patients who had wall ant distal radius fracture versus general anesthesia distal radius fracture, and the wall ant patients actually did better. This is Dr. Steve Kohler from New York doing a both bone forearm plating in a 12 year old boy uh, in 2020 uh, in COVID. Uh, in 2020 in April in COVID, they could not get into the main operating room because the main operating room was filled with COVID patients. So Steve Kohler took his uh, patients to minor procedure rooms and he published his infection rates. And I sent you a copy of that paper or, or uh, this morning. So if, if, you see, you, if you want to see his infection rates, you'll see them. And if you want to see his review article of uh, Wallant, we sent you a link for this. It's free. You don't need a subscription to PRS Global Open. You just go on the link and you will see uh, five excellent videos, including this one by Dr. Steve Kohler uh, in New York. And if you want more webinars, we can invite Dr. Kohler and Dr. Ahmad to join us for more uh, uh, wall ant webinars to the Ukrainian surgeons, if you would like this. Uh, every week on LinkedIn, there are new videos with people using Wallant. Dr. Carolina Alvarez of Venezuela just put this out on LinkedIn. It's after she reduces an elbow fracture. Thomas Apar from France also has done elbow fractures. This is a radial head fracture uh, with in, uh, an acute radial nerve palsy. See the patient is having a hard time extending the wrist and Dr. Apar uh, did this with Wallant. He fixed the radial head and decompressed the radial nerve. And there he is uh, doing active control. You see pronation, supination after he's fixed the radial head. And he decompressed the radial nerve. And the patient was actually able to extend the thumb and extend the wrist right during the surgery after the nerve decompression uh, under wall end. This is a clavicle fracture by Dr. Chen Yu Chen from Taiwan and testing the movement of the patient after he's put the plate on the clavicle fracture. This is all done with wall end, zero, uh, zero uh, sedation. Uh, this is Amir Ahmad uh, doing a patellar fracture. And this is what it looks like when you see it accelerated. We don't inject this fast, but uh, we only have 50 minutes to show you these things. So we're going to show you what it looks like, but you can see how it's totally blown up and you go in front of the patella, you go behind it. And here's after he has wired the patella, testing his active extension of the knee. And you can do tibias. I know most of you would nail tibias, but here's showing that you can actually plate a tibia and it's the same principle. Uh, and you can use 100 or 200 cc's to do these. There he is inside the uh, fracture site. And there's the plate on the tibia. And here's the patient uh, doing the active movement. So you don't need sedation. You don't need general anesthesia to do these long bone fractures. Here are 
Uh, here's an ankle fracture. He's asking the patient if there's any pain. Uh, the patient says, no, there's no pain. And a lot of foot and ankle surgeons are doing a lot of wide awake foot and ankle surgery, just like we're doing wide awake hand surgery today. Uh, this is a below knee amputation by my friend Asif Admani from Mombasa, Kenya. And it's the same principle. Uh, you just blow up the subcutaneous space, blow all around the bone, uh, blow the proximal nerve stumps under direct vision, just blow the epineurium of the proximal nerve stumps under direct vision. And uh, you can do below knee amputations in totally unsedated patients. This is a forearm amputation with Wallant in another patient who was not in very good shape. Uh, and there you again, you can see the uh, tumescent local anesthesia, first blowing everywhere subcutaneous, then walking the bone with the needle. And then when you get in there, you blow the proximal stumps of the uh, nerves under direct vision. And you can see the tumescence even in dark colored skin. And uh, the patient, said all he could feel was the vibration of the saw because you can't stop the vibration from being transmitted to the elbow and the patient. And here he asked, did you feel pain when we injected the local anesthesia? And he said, I just felt the first needle going in and after there was no pain, uh, but I could feel a vibration sense during the bone cutting, otherwise there was no pain. So if you inject local anesthesia properly, uh, it, you can do a lot of things. So the second major change in Canadian surgery that may help you is field sterility. And that means just the part that you're operating on. And there is a lot of evidence behind field sterility. There are at least uh, three papers showing that K-wires in the main operating room have the same infection rate as outside the main operating room. Uh, and this is how we do almost all of our carpal tunnels in Canada with field sterility. That means just the part you're operating on. I don't even prep the back of the hand. I'm not operating on the back of the hand. And I certainly don't prep the floor and I don't prep the patient's feet. I'm not operating on his feet, I'm operating on his hand. And if you respect sterility and surgeons understand sterility, we don't need nurses to explain it to us. If you are only operating on sterilized area, you're going to have a very safe infection rate. So we published this paper uh, 11 years ago now, 1,500 cases done like this with an infection rate of 0.39%. Only six out of 1,500 patients got infections and they were all only minor infections. No one needed incision and drainage. Nobody needed IV antibiotics. And here's the garbage for carpal tunnel done in the main operating room with full sterility and done in a minor procedure room with field sterility. And there's no difference in infection outcome. This is proven now. And all of this garbage is also material. And this may be material that's hard for you to come by in the Ukraine in the next while. Uh, and the cost of this is also ridiculously expensive. We've shown that it's five times more expensive than it has to be. I've sent you a link for this paper this morning. This is called Evidence-Based Sterility. It looks at all of the papers that talk about sterility, including uh, uh, rooms with um, air exchange, forced air exchange rooms. Uh, you don't need to have rooms with fancy air exchange to do most hand surgery procedures. The only evidence for rooms with high air exchange is 
in uh, plating fractures in orthopedics. But a lot of uh, the, if you look at that evidence, it is underwhelming. The numbers are just marginal. And uh, really I'll bet that someday somebody will come out with better papers showing that there's probably no difference. But until then, uh, I think it's still wiser if you can to do plates and screws in the main operating room with full sterility. Even though uh, Steve Kohler showed that he could do it in New York outside the main operating room, if you have a choice, it might be a better idea. I'll tell you why in a minute. But most things that don't need plates, anything that needs a K-wire, flexor tendon repairs, and all that kind of stuff. In many cities in Canada, this is how we're doing it with field sterility. So here we're repairing tendons or we're doing K wires and it looks just like this. And uh, our infection rates are the same as when we used to do them in the main operating room 30 years ago. We've been doing it like this uh, for at least uh, 30 years in St. John, New Brunswick, and in many other cities like Calgary and so on, Ottawa. So there are many American cities that have moved their surgery out of the main operating room into minor procedure rooms. And there have been many cost papers. How much does it cost? Uh, this is one from Hershey, Pennsylvania in 2019 saying it was seven times the cost, 10 times the garbage to do it uh, with Mac uh, and in a surgery center, twice the cost and five times the garbage. There have been at least 10 cost papers in the last two years. So here's the part that I would like, this is an important point about sterility. So this is a total knee, this is a carpal tunnel. If I am having a total knee prosthesis, I want full sterility in a main operating room. I want a spacesuit. Why? Because if I get an infection having a total knee, I'm screwed. I might even lose my leg. I mean, certainly I'm going to lose many months of function and it may be stiff permanently. But if I get an infection with a carpal tunnel, so what? Who cares? Give me a little Keflex, maybe drain a little abscess, although that almost never happens, and I'm going to be fine. So it's time to stop treating all operations with the same sterility when infection outcomes are extremely different with different operations. And that's what evidence-based sterility is all about. It's how much does the infection affect the patient? And if the infection doesn't affect the patient that much, you know, we don't need full sterility. Uh, let me give you another example. Would you ever start an intravenous with spacesuit sterility? No, but an intravenous is a piece of plastic going into the vein through the skin, going directly to the heart and staying there for a week. Think about that. A lot of uh, developing countries, this is Kumasi, Ghana, have moved out of the main operating room with Wallant procedure rooms. This is the first day that they opened the Wallant room in Ghana, Kumasi, Ghana. I did that. Uh, I was president of the Hand Association with Scott Cozen who's right here, he was president of the American Hand Society in 2017. And I did that because I brought, I donated 10 instrument trays. That's a basic instrument tray, uh, you know, scissors, driver, scalpel handle, forceps. And with 10 instrument trays, they were able to open a Wallant minor procedure room and do 10 cases per day. This was in 2017, and then that first year, they did 358 cases. Now they're still doing 500 cases per year. My old instruments, I'm sure, are gone, but they're still doing these. And these are patients who could not afford 
the main operating room sterility and they could not afford the main operating room anesthesiologists. So now they can afford to have hand surgery in Kumasi, Ghana, and they couldn't afford it before. And this is all you need. You just need basic instruments. And this is what we have in our hospital. And all of these instruments on the right are wrapped separately. So in little packages, we have towel clips for fracture reduction, retractors, K-wires, freer elevators, a K-wire driver, rangers for amputation, and so on. And we open them up when we need them. The only other thing you need beside a basic tray of instruments is you need some kind of a K-wire driver, either battery powered or electric, any room without special ventilation, and a low power C-arm or a C-arm, or now the micro C-arm that's coming in to insert K-wires and check your reduction after you've fixed your fracture. Another way to uh, another way to avoid uh, infection is to not use transcutaneous nylon sutures. Uh, I close all of my incisions with buried 5O dermal monocryl simple interrupted sutures. This is not a running suture. These are simple interrupted sutures. And uh, this is how I close everything. My ulnar nerves, my tendon, forearm tendon surgeries, uh, and so on. Uh, and this means no sutures to remove. And Catherine Curtin from California published a paper uh, last year showing that the infection rate is less because you don't have transcutaneous nylon sutures. And if you're still using transcutaneous nylon sutures, I suggest that you try moving to this. It will decrease your infection rate and you will not have to take stitches out. And that's what your wound looks like at the end. We let these patients get in the shower the next day. There's none of this bandaging or splinting. Uh, and this is for carpal tunnel. But uh, this is what the sutures uh, look like. Uh, in cartoon form. I'm going to show that to you, I think, or not. Yeah, right there. There we go. That's what they look like with the knot buried deep, and they're at about 45 degrees to the skin. So if you want to decrease your infection rate, try that. Now, there's nothing magic about the main operating room and sterile saline. The magic is proper irrigation with effective analgesia. So this is me uh, dealing with this uh, crush injury to a hand with a dirty wound. There's a fractured metacarpal in there. There's exposed extensor tendon in there. Uh, I blew up his wrist, just like I did for the shotgun guy that you saw in the beginning. And then we washed him out with nice clean tap water. If your tap water is contaminated, you can then flush it out with iodine uh, to kill any germs, or you can flush it out with bottled water, which is essentially sterile. This patient never went to the operating room. We admitted him to the floor and we let everything heal secondarily with Vaseline and bandages. These were, this was the days before VAC. Today, we would put a VAC dressing on. Now I'm going to move into infection. So this is a fight bite from a tooth. And uh, three out of four nights, I do not have a resident. So I do these cases on my own. And I did this case on my own a couple of years ago on a Friday night, because I've been doing this for years. So the first thing I do is I inject volarly 10 milliliters without moving the needle to block all of the volar nerves. And I'm going to explain why in a minute, but there's the fight bite. We flip it over and I put 10 cc's right there without moving the needle. Now it's a lot slower than that, but that's it. Then I draw the area of cellulitis with a pen. And then I inject outside the area of cellulitis where you see here in blue on the left, 
I inject that with tumescent local anesthesia. So I put 40 milliliters on the outside, 10 milliliters on the Palmer side. And again, I go from radial to ulnar to radial to ulnar, and I'm talking to the Until patient. All of your pain is gone. And so while the local anesthesia is working, then I do the paperwork and organize to have him admitted for IV antibiotics and educate the patient because I want to wait a half an hour for the epinephrine to work. You never inject and cut. You inject, 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 and then cut the first one if you have three patients. None I'll explain this. that in a minute. None of this. And until you're on Advil, while you're on Advil, how long? You don't know what hurts. So I do patient education, I do the paperwork, then I debride the tendon, the uh, joint capsule, and then my favorite part of infection is to walk over to the sink. And right there, straighten out your fingers again. Make a fist again. So it's not hurting, right? No. Zero pain, right? Zero pain. So tonight, when it starts to hurt, they're going to give you 800 of Advil. Mm -hmm. If that's not enough, they're going to give you a gram of Tylenol. And only if so a well-educated patient on how to look after his hand with infection is the most important thing. So here's the morning after in the hospital. You see there's no swelling. Why? Because he listened to me. He was awake when I explained to him how important it was for him to keep his hand up. So that's what he looked like the morning after. We put him in this little splint, we sent him home, and here he is four weeks after surgery. So I've been managing fight bites outside the operating room for many years. Uh, and finally, somebody wrote a paper on it just in 2020. Uh, and this is from the United States showing that you don't have to go to the operating room for hand abscesses and you, you, for a better outcome. There's nothing magic about the operating room. The magic is in good anesthesia and copious irrigation and cutting out all the dead here tissue. Have flexor synovitis, there was a dog bite here. Yeah. So this is flexor synovitis from a dog bite. And uh, this lady had classic pain on extension, fusiform swelling, uh, pain when you palpated the flexor tendon sheath, she had cellulitis, she had lymphangitis, and what we, we didn't have to operate on this lady because she responded to antibiotics with pain-guided healing and elevation and immobilization. And a lot of flexor synovitis does not need surgery. Uh, and they do better if you do not have surgery. Uh, here she is on eight weeks after the surgery. If you don't cut that sheath open, they do a lot better than if you do. But sometimes you do need to operate on them. And when you operate on them, I do not use a median nerve block at the wrist. I do use a common digital nerve block in the palm. And I don't use a median nerve block at the wrist because we did a study where me and a dozen medical students were all injected in both hands, and it took us 100 minutes for a complete block of median nerve at the wrist. 100 minutes. The bigger the nerve, the longer it takes. But if you inject common digital nerves, because they're smaller nerves, in 30 minutes, you have 100% complete intense block. So I like to block right there, just distal to the transverse carpal ligament. I do not block these in the wrist. So I block it right there. So this is a flexor synovitis case that is full of pus. There's the black uh, dead skin that the Staph aureus has already started to infarct. This finger's full of pus. I have to drain this one, but that's where I put the block. And again, it's proximal to the area of cellulitis. And you can see that I am going to draw. Try not to move. 
it's going to be hard not to just do your best. So when I say go, I want you to take a deep breath. Okay. So one, go deep breath. Great. You were great. You hardly moved a muscle. So here you see, I've drawn the area of cellulitis. I go proximal to the area of cellulitis, but I do a common digital nerve block. And I start with a 30 gauge needle with a three cc syringe. And then I move to a 10 cc syringe with a bigger 27 gauge needle. And I put in a total of 20 milliliters in this palm to make sure that it was totally completely numb. Here you'll see me move to a bigger syringe, 10 cc syringe with a 27 gauge needle. And um, I'm gonna accelerate the uh, injection speed a little bit. So this is 10 times faster. And he's not feeling this at all. He just felt the first needle, that's it. He's not feeling any of this. So he felt one little tiny poke. So I'm adding a little more. Now we're nice and numb. I'm in the emergency department with this 80 year old man who is too, uh, he's not able to get up and walk. So I was not able to take him over to the tap and irrigate him like I did the other patient. I would, but I couldn't because he couldn't walk. So I drain the pus, I culture it. I had to make a separate incision in the finger. Uh, I drained that pus and then I irrigate everything with copious amounts of betadine uh, I would do this in the sink with tap water normally. Uh, and I make, again, short incisions. I don't open up the whole finger. That's not necessary to do. You just need to drain the pus. And then I irrigate this with a catheter. And then I go on the other end and I irrigate the flexor tendon sheath uh, from the other end until I see clear liquid with no pus squirting out of the wound. Now I know I'm irrigated. Now he can get intravenous antibiotics, doesn't have to go into the main operating room if you can't get there. You can do this in a hallway. You can do this in a bomb shelter underneath your hospital. You don't need to go to the main operating room to do this. This is an infected hematoma. Uh, and I did this in a minor, in a clinic room. This wasn't even our minor procedure room. This is an examining room in our hospital. Once again, tumescent local anesthesia until you can see it and feel it everywhere you're gonna cut. So the entire tibial bone here gets blown up. All of the tibial soft tissue gets blown up with lidocaine and epinephrine. This was 120 milliliters of 0.25% lidocaine with one in 400,000 epinephrine. And here I am with my headlight in this uh, examining room and I cut out all of the dead tissue. This patient never came into hospital. He went directly from the clinic room into an examining room. I drained his infected tibial hematoma. We started him on oral cephalexin if you give cephalexin by mouth, you get 90% of the blood levels uh, half an hour later compared to if you give it intravenously. You don't have to give cephalexin intravenously. If you give it orally, it's very effective. And then after we've uh, given him oral cephalexin, cut out all of the dead tissue, we copiously irrigate with uh, bridine and tap water. We're gonna put Vaseline and a Coban bandage on there. So that's clean right now. Right. All the old clot is out, all the dead tissues out. So you need to stay off your foot. You're, you don't drive anywhere. You sit in the back seat as a passenger with your leg up. Get off all painkillers and listen to your body. Just don't do stuff that hurts. Okay. If you're doing something that hurts, you're helping the germs. Just keep remembering that. And you don't know what hurts if you have painkillers in your ears. So no painkillers. Don't do stuff that hurts. Keep your leg up. Keep taking the antibiotics. Shower every day. Take the bandage right off. And I'm going to show you how to put a clean bandage on. It's 
So this is just Vaseline. That's great. Just so the wound doesn't dry and die. And then you just make sure that there's enough that the whole thing gets covered with dry and die. And then you just put that on there like that. Okay. Basically, I think it takes that's that's exactly what we're doing now because i just drained it today i'm going to take a second dose because yep. you know some of that water might come out of there okay but after your shower tomorrow you just need one just dose. One. okay so he's going to get in the shower tomorrow he knows exactly how to look after his wound because he's got no sedation he knows exactly how to put the bandage on so we saw him uh, one week after on the top right, and here he is 10 weeks after, healed secondarily, never went to the operating room, never was admitted to hospital. So you can handle these things in the hallway. Uh, we never even went to our minor procedure room in the clinic. I just did him in an examining room because our minor procedure rooms were filled with urologists doing vasectomies that morning. So uh, if you Google uh, simple care for wounds. And I think I sent you a link for this this morning. This is how to look after all of these wounds with just Vaseline, Coban tape, or, or any kind of uh, clean bandage. You don't need sterile bandages. You can use diapers, panty liners, sanitary napkins. We've proven that those things are virtually as sterile as sterile gauze and much cheaper and much more available if you can't get sterile supplies. You only need clean supplies. The third major change in Canadian surgery that may be helpful for you is how to inject local anesthesia so it doesn't hurt. And you'd like your patients to think you're a magician and you want to aim for zero pain of local anesthesia. And you never want to have to top it up with more local anesthesia during the surgery. And I'm not going to go through all of these rules because I sent you a link to all of these rules with a video for each one of them on how to not hurt people. And if you just Google uh, 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 minimal... I think it's a little problem with Professor Lund connect. Okay. Oh, yeah, cool. here we go. Worst of it. So that wasn't sore? Not a bit. Okay. I didn't feel a thing. Great. So this is for a forehead flap after a basal cell skin cancer excision. Uh, always reinsert the needle in an area that's numb. This is done with field sterility outside the main operating room, but I'm wearing a gown so that I don't get blood on my shirt. <laughs> how, how much did the surgery bother you? Very little, really. Well, so uh, it's how long ago since we did the reconstruction? I would say it's at least a year and a half. Uh, I would say probably a two on a scale from one zero to ten. Yeah, compared to going to the dentist. First of all, it doesn't hurt as much as the dentist. How much the uh, freezing hurt when I put the needle in to put in the numbing medicine? How much did that hurt? The freezing never hurt at all. Can you tell me how sore the freezing was, the local anesthesia? The freezing, I didn't feel at all. So even if you get medical students, uh, they can learn how to do this. This is a skin graft harvested with field sterility uh, after excision of a big cancer on a forehead. And this is how you inject so it doesn't Did hurt. that hurt at all? Did what hurt? I guess not, eh? So if you, if you have an open wound, you inject into the fat. And as soon as you see the liquid stop coming back out, you know you're in the fat. And as soon as you see the fat start to inflate, you stop moving the needle and you just leave your needle right there. And you put in a big volume till you see it swell up. You see the local anesthesia swelling up there and he's not feeling any of this. He didn't even feel the first needle. I did this whole skin graft and all he felt was one poke 
uh, on the back when I did the um, skin graft. So there you see the area of tumescent local anesthesia right here. And now I'm gonna put my second needle one centimeter inside where the tissues are tumescent. So he doesn't feel that. And then I'm going to blow it up all around, always from proximal to distal. So the supraorbital, supratrochlear nerves go from here up. So you always inject from proximal to distal. And then we did the same thing on the uh, scalp side. We uh, injected all that. We cleaned off the granulation tissue because this was cut out a week earlier by our Mohs uh, surgeons. And then we go ahead. You're right, that was neat, but it didn't hurt a bit. That's good. That's the patient who said it didn't hurt a bit. And there's the skin graft. And there he is one week after with the donor site already right. healed. Uh, and there like he that. is two months after the surgery. So you can do these skin grafts outside the main operating room. I haven't done a skin graft in the main operating room for the last three years. And all you need is a nitrogen tank outside the main operating room. So if you, get, if you take a nitrogen tank down to your bomb shelter, you can harvest skin grafts in your bomb shelter. After I inject the local anesthesia for long procedures, I let the patients get up and go to the bathroom so they don't have to pee during the surgery. And you never run an intravenous because that'll make them have to pee. But you always wait 30 minutes before you cut because it takes 26 minutes for maximal vasoconstriction, not seven minutes, which came from a 1987 pig study. There's level one evidence in humans that it takes 26 minutes for maximal vasoconstriction after adrenaline. And it also takes half an hour for maximal numbness for small nerve uh, numbing. Um, and so if you're doing a number of small cases, these are all carpal tunnels, all four of these patients have been injected. So you inject the first patients, then operate on the first one, then go inject the fifth one while your nurse uh, turns over the room. And I can easily do 15 cases per day, just me and one nurse comfortably. Um, if you're doing a spaghetti wrist, if you ask the patient to move the index finger, the index finger stump moves more than the other stumps. Also, if you pull on the proximal tendons, just ask the patient, which finger am I pulling? And they will tell you, oh, you're pulling on my long finger. Oh, you're pulling on my index finger because uh, they can feel the um, movement in the muscle, the stretch receptors in the muscle. You're more likely to kill a patient with sedation than you are to kill a finger with epinephrine or adrenaline. If it's, it's extremely rare if it exists and it probably doesn't exist just like true anaphylaxis to lidocaine probably doesn't exist. It, it, you probably cannot kill a finger with epinephrine. But the mortality rate in the United States for healthy people having elective surgery is one in 100,000 uh, for general anesthesia. And this paper of 3,110 consecutive cases, not one dead finger with epinephrine or adrenaline in the finger. This we published uh, 17 years ago. This is my own hand, 30 minutes after epinephrine one in a thousand in my long finger, epinephrine one in 10,000 in my ring finger and epinephrine one in a hundred thousand in my small finger, they're still alive. I've had my own fingers injected with epinephrine over 40 times. Every paper that I've ever published, I was the first person to be injected. And there are many cases of accidental one in a thousand epinephrine in the literature, not one dead finger. So adrenaline does not kill fingers, but there are two problems with Wallant. There's the adrenaline rush, 
So I tell each and every patient right after I inject that they may feel a little shaky like they've had too much coffee. That's because there's adrenaline in the freezing and they may get an adrenaline rush. And I tell them it's normal, it's temporary, it will go away all by itself in 15 or 20 minutes if you get it and you are not allergic to it. And that way they don't panic if they get it. The second problem with Wallant is fainting. And when you put the needle in, some people faint. And people faint because there's not enough blood going to their head. I'm going to show you videos of people who are fainting. These are not seizures. These are young 56 volunteer healthy fainters where they induce fainting by hyperventilation while squatting and then Valsalva and then these people faint. And look at what they look like when they faint. You might think that's a seizure and your nurses might think that's a seizure especially when they see their eyes rolling up like this. But these are not seizures, these are fainting. And how can you tell the difference between a seizure and a faint? Uh, because, sorry, I missed a slide there. Because people who have seizures are confused when they wake up. People who faint have zero confusion when they wake up. When people who faint wake up, they're 100% there. And when people faint, they are always back at it in less than 30 seconds. People who have a seizure may take a lot longer than 30 seconds uh, of seizure activity before they stop seizuring. So how do you avoid fainting? You always inject patients laying down so there's more blood going to their head. Do not inject Wallant with patients sitting up. The second thing, recognize how it's happening. If the patient says, I'm not feeling very well, or I think I'm going to be sick, or they get pale between the eyes and start to yawn, those are signs that they're going to faint. And if they say that, the first thing I do to get more blood to the brain is to lift up the thighs. There's two liters of blood in the thighs that goes directly to the brain. Then I take the pillow out from under their head, put it underneath their feet to get more blood to the brain. Then I put the bed in Trendelenburg. That gets more blood to the brain. And you can see all of that took me less than a minute to do because I've seen it many times and so will you if you do enough wall at. Finally, this is the last slide. Uh, the new uh, Wide Awake Hand Surgery and Therapy Tips book has just been published. There's over 500 videos there. You may not be able to get the book delivered to you in uh, uh, the Ukraine, but you can see the online version and you can see the 500 hours of video. And I don't mind advertising it because I'm not making any money on it. The money goes to the lean and green effort dedicated to promoting less unnecessary cost and unnecessary garbage in hand surgery. And I'd like to thank one of my co-authors, Jean Dr. Jean-Paul Brutus, who's also a Canadian from Montreal, he's going to talk to you after we answer the questions. And uh, I'm going to stop now, and I'm going to stop sharing, and we're going to answer any questions that people may have. And then Dr. Brutus is going to show you a few slides, and we'll answer more questions. So, Andre, if you want to unmute. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a few uh, tips and tricks uh, for about faint. I uh, ask them, patients, my patients, to eat something just about an hour or hour and a half before the procedure, before uh, I make uh, the uh, anesthesia. So uh, they have enough glucose in the blood. And that's to help to avoid uh, faith. So we have a few questions. Uh, many of them Jean-Paul Brutus uh, uh, answered in the chat box, but I, I will uh, answer uh, in, uh, some of them. So... Uh, 
Uh, is it necessary to inject an anesthetic solution intraosseously during the operation uh, on the bones or just uh, about uh, periosteum? Yeah, I, I don't do long bone surgery, but my orthopedic colleagues who do long bone fractures say you don't have to inject it in the bone. I know that in the hand you don't. Uh, if you bathe all of the periosteum all around, it, that's all you need to do in the hand. Jean-Paul, do you know the answer to that? I would, I would say the same thing. I uh, don't think you need to inject in the bone, just to, all around and to make sure you get all the periosteum and you're good to go. No need to inject inside the bone. Thanks. Uh, the another uh, question is about uh, antibiotics. Uh, how, what is your scheme for antibiotics? When you use antibiotics and uh, do you make uh, one single injection or uh, before operation or maybe after operation or maybe in tablets? Only tablets, no injections. Keflex is what we usually use, cephalexin. And in a tablet by mouth, you get 90% of the blood level that you would do if you gave it intravenously. You don't need to give Keflex intravenously. For carpal tunnels and all other soft tissue infections or so soft tissue surgeries that are not infected, no antibiotics for me. And if they have infection, I give them, if it's bad infection, then they get an intravenous and they get intravenous antibiotics. But even the guy with the tibial hematoma, he just got tablets because he wasn't septic. It just was local. It wasn't throughout his body. I think if you have infection throughout your body, intravenous antibiotics is good. If it's just localized, I think tablets are fine. Jean-Paul? Fully agree. Um, the best treatment of an abscess is the uh, the incision and the drainage. So I agree with Don. If it's local, you need local treatment, uh, which is the incision, and you can consider antibiotics. But really, uh, you know, for an abscess, the typical treatment is is no antibiotics. It's just drainage and irrigation. Um, and I think the way Don does it is fantastic with just tap water, lots of it, and teach the patient to use their own shower to clean it. And as far as elective procedures, um, uh, I don't use any antibiotics at all. Only when I put in an implant, like a, like a prosthesis or something like that. Right. And then I would give it per mouth. I give 24 hours uh, per mouth. Uh, maybe one dose would be enough, but I have a private practice. So I'd like to be on the safer side, but never do I use IV. And of course, uh, and even when I treat um, a, uh, a flexor tenosynovitis, uh, after, for example, a trigger release, uh, it can happen. I do the same thing as Don does, uh, the same type of anesthesia, um, pure local no sedation. And um, I will irrigate, irrigate, and irrigate, and give uh, um, antibiotics uh, per mouth. Uh, just because the consequences of an uncontrolled infection around the flexor tendons can be really damaging, I will do more than just um, irrigate and debride just to be on the safer side because of the consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's it. I, I never, never use IV antibiotics. Of course, my patients never get septic because they, they would come to me before they get to that point. But I agree if the patient has lymphangitis, has um, fever, chills, and all those nice things, then obviously you need to give them IV on top of. And then if you have a, a nasty wound, not necessarily infected, but contaminated, which can happen uh, in a war context with uh, you know um, earth or debris or all sorts of things. Irrigation is super important, but then I would consider uh, antibiotics um, prophylactically before it gets infected if it's heavily contaminated by all sorts of stuff. So in, in your context right now, I think antibiotics can, can be very useful. I see. Uh, so another question was about uh, allergy to lidocaine. Uh, we know that's that's extremely rare, but uh, do you have uh, some patients with allergy in your practice? So I don't believe that it's possible to have an anaphylactic reaction to uh, lidocaine or lignocaine. I have looked up every uh, case 
And I've, I do this every two or three years. I look up every pos, you know, you get these anaphylaxis to lidocaine. I look it up. And if you read the cases, there are some that might be true. Most of them, there's other drugs, there's other stuff. Patient came from another hospital. We didn't see it, but they said it happened, blah, blah, blah. When you think of the fact that more than 2 billion people, 2 billion people have had lidocaine since it was invented in 1948 in dental offices all over the world. If there was true allergy, I'm talking anaphylaxis. I'm not talking skin rash, dermatology reaction stuff. That doesn't count. No, that never killed anybody. I'm talking about anaphylaxis. If there was true anaphylaxis to lidocaine after 2 billion doses since 1948, we'd be hearing about it all the time. There would be ambulance, uh, ambulances with lawyers in them chasing American dentists all over the place. I don't think it's possible to have true anaphylaxis to lidocaine. I don't even ask people. I don't say, are you allergic to lidocaine? I don't care. I know they're not. Agree fully. I, I've never seen one. Uh, never seen one. And there's only one case that I can remember where the patient was adamant telling me, oh, I'm allergic and because whatever. And uh, enough that I, I investigated to see what other anesthetic I could use on her. And I did use another one, but don't ask me which one because I don't even remember. That's how rare that is. And I don't know whether that patient was really allergic or not. But again, if she tells me I'm really allergic uh, and I give her something and then something happens, I can't afford that. So that's why I did it. But it's, yeah. it's so rare. No, and I agree. I've had lots of people tell me they're allergic to it. And I've had lots of doctors send me patients convinced that they're allergic to lidocaine. And you know what I do with those? If they want, I take them, and I've done this 10 times at least, I take them to the emergency department. I put a monitor on them. I get ready with epinephrine. I get ready with a crash cart. I get ready with Benadryl. I get ready with steroids. And then I inject them with lidocaine and epinephrine. And in all 10 cases, you know what happened? Nothing. Nothing. Awesome. And they were convinced, every one of them. Most people who think they're allergic to lidocaine are actually getting an adrenaline rush or they fainted. And some smart doctor or some smart nurse said, oh, you're allergic to that stuff. Don't ever have that again. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, another question is, uh, what is, uh, can you please repeat the principle of mixing ratio uh, to preparing the solution? Uh, how many lidocaine, uh, epinephrine and other? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Let's go back to that slide. And it's really very simple. No more than 50 milliliters of uh, lidocaine with epinephrine. Here, hang on a sec, I'll get there. It's worth waiting just a minute. And then Jean-Paul, maybe you can put your slides up afterward. Yeah, I will, but, but I think it's good that you, uh, repetition is the mother of skill. <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah, Raja Sabapati said that too. So uh, if no more than 50 milliliters of 1% lidocaine with, a, with uh, adrenaline. And if you need more than 50 milliliters, you just add saline. And so what you do is you look at the wound and you go, okay, I think I'm going to need 200 cc's. And, and if you get the wide awake hand surgery book, it will tell you how many milliliters you need for every operation there is. Like every one of the operations I showed you um, has a chapter in the book and you can see the recipe uh, for all, the, all of the uh, different operations in the book. And there's an atlas that shows you if you put 20 cc's here, where does it go? That's also in the book. An Atlas of Tumescent Local Anesthesia. It's the first chapter. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have a sense for you. <laughs> Professor Lalonde, thank you for a great uh, talk, for a great lecture. And uh, I think we've, we have done with your questions. So Perfect. So Jean-Paul, do you want to share? Sure. 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 Let me share my screen. Oh. Trying to share and I make you a co-host, so you uh, go to the bottom and you see green share screen. Do you see that? I do. I just have a, a weird window that. Uh, what does it say? It say it says a uh, uh, desktop. Well, let's see, desktop one maybe. Yeah, hit hit your desktop. Okay, let's. Uh, and then you'll see your screen, and we'll all see your desktop. That's strange. Now I have a security and privacy thing. Okay, let's see if I can allow Zoom, maybe. Yeah, you, you may have your computer set that you can't do it. Oh, no. Okay. So I'm trying, I'm trying. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> we have plenty of time here, so. Yeah, maybe Andre has other comments while you're trying to share that we haven't you addressed. Do. Uh, something about adrenaline rush. Uh, I, I say to my patients, it's like you jump with a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, like, you just imagine you jump with a parachute. It's something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And uh, for today, I make with wool and almost all of my tendon transfers okay even even a big one uh on the forearm for uh, ner uh radial nerve palsy you do a triple radial nerve transfer with yes yeah. yes, yes i make it all with wallant and i make uh almost everything in the hand with wallant and uh, still, I make a uh, distal radius with a uh, uh, nerve block, but uh, I think I can try. First, I will try with some easier cases, and maybe then I will try with uh, great big. Yeah, I, I will be right back. I'm going to get my tech support. All right. Okay. 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 Won't be long. So yeah, so one, one trick that I didn't put in my PowerPoint is if you have never done wall ant, here's an interesting way to try. And maybe you can try this for your first distal radius, Andre. Do it with general anesthesia, like you normally do. But as soon as the patient is asleep, as soon as they're asleep, blow it up with wall ant, like blow it up with local anesthesia, put on the tourniquet, but don't inflate it. You go prep and drape, you know, by the time you start, it won't be maybe 26 minutes, but it's, it's going to be, um, you know, uh, pretty good time. And so uh, one, then you just cut without the tourniquet and you'll see it's going to bleed a little bit. I mean, it's wall ant surgery is not no blood, right, Andre? Yeah, there's, there's some blood, but it's not crazy, you know, amount of blood. Uh, I mostly fear not not uh, about blood. Uh, you can use your coagulation or uh, something like that, but about the pain of uh, patient. Uh, yeah, like 